Okay, just a quick announcement, as you're all going to become educated and illuminated. Um, on Tuesday, Council Day, at 1.30, is Environmental Management meeting, and I'm going to have two zero waste resolutions on that. Um, one, diverting compostables, and the other, diverting recyclables. So the object there is obviously that we're going to get all of that out of the landfill or and make sure there's no incinerator goes in. Mm -hmm. And then in another <coughs> two weeks, then I'm going to have doing one on education. And then on the 31st, I expect to have bills that will actually prohibit recyclables and compostables from going into the landfill and going through this transition period. And there'll be more, including a styrofoam ban and um, a lot. So basically the idea for me is that you all are able to mobilize and with the knowledge that we have, um, provide the momentum and get people so that they are educated. Um, and then we don't have to have another landfill, we don't have an incinerator, and we're able to do a zero waste program without any of that low on the bottom priority. So, um, anyway, so you can act on everything you learned tonight because it'll impact in terms of the big picture or compostables or recyclables and how we do that now that we've at least shelved the incinerator for the time being, as long as we get, fill the void with what we want. Your dates, Tuesday one time? Tuesday at 1.30, okay. And the 31st of what month? And of this month, so there's the... This is Mars. February. Oh, no, this is February. <laughs> okay, no, um, March. So the 3rd of March, the 17th of March, at the, right, the 3rd of March, the 17th of March, and then the law ones, there'll be several, um, and that'll be three, on the 31st. So it's all we're putting together, the pieces of the pizza, that we have to get them all working. We have to, how do you get it in, how do you get it out, where it goes, all of that, how you engage people and discourage them from what they should do. So here is the wisdom of all of this, who's going to help us um, so that when we're asked questions, we know um, how to handle it. You had to say pizza, didn't you? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for it. so hard for us. Many of you might know about Mike or may have read something that we sent out to attract you here. And uh, we have this is being recorded and it will go online. I'm having the feeling that a lot of people who would like to be here are opting to watch the video online. So for that, I will say as the founder and director of Energy Justice Network, the national support network for grassroots community groups fighting dirty energy and waste industry facilities. Mike has been actively involved in student and community environmental justice organizing since high school in 1990. Wow. And I'm proud to say that Mike is my homeboy. We are both from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I'm proud of what he's done. He's taught hundreds of workshops at college campuses and activist conference, conferences throughout the U.S. His grassroots support work has helped many communities achieve victories against power plants, landfills, incinerators, medical waste facilities, and other polluted industries. Among them was going to be the world's largest tire incinerator. I just shudder when I think about that in our beautiful home state of Pennsylvania. So, Mike, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. Tracy, can you feel my tech person to see if this can magically appear on this video somehow? Okay. Does this thing work? Yes. Yeah. Great. That's great. Okay. So, um, we have an intimate group today, and I can launch into a number of different things, but I don't want to just dive into presentation mode unless that's what you want me. Um, I came here prepared to give you all the gory details about why incinerators are bad, and now um, maybe that's not necessary as much uh, because the project has been shelved for now. So we can go into some of that if you want. We can go into more on the zero waste side. I also came prepared to do stuff on environmental justice, and uh, get, there's a 
fun presentation on some of that stuff. So whatever makes sense, um, if we want to do the whole thing as Q&A, that's fine with me as well. Um, so let's get some guidance on what will make the most sense, because I don't want to just assume and spend all your time doing more. Well, maybe I can help kick that off, because when we're out in the community and we're talking about incineration, a lot of times what, the first thing that we'll hear is, Sweden has incinerators everywhere and they work so great and there's this sort of this idea that people from Sweden are hip and knowledgeable and why can't we be like them? Like what's wrong with Sweden? Oh. Well, <laughs> one of the first things that pops into mind is that I think it's Sweden where they're incinerating bunny rabbits in a certain town where they have too many. So if that alone damages the credibility enough to think that it's a model, um, think of that point. But um, in Sweden and several other countries in Europe, they actually have, um, they're using inci trash incinerators to heat things, not just as waste disposal facilities or to make the nominal amounts of electricity that these make, um, but to heat buildings, especially when you're up in Sweden, you know, it's pretty cold, you need to be able to heat buildings. And so they can't stop feeding these things. So they have these machines that have to be fed waste and they don't have enough waste anymore because they're recycling too much. So they're having to import trash from other countries, just have enough trash to feed these incinerators and heat their buildings. And so throughout Europe, they're starting to realize that they've overcommitted to trash incineration and that they need to move away from that. And that trend is starting to reverse, thankfully. So it's not like they magically work across the ocean, but companies love to point across oceans and say, oh, they're doing it. And they do the same thing in Europe and other countries. They point to the US and say, oh, they love it in the US. And people were like, oh, well, it must be right then. So we always look up to these countries. And so just recognize that there are fundamental flaws with incineration that don't magically disappear when you go across an ocean. And so I can get into some of those if we can get this working. It'll be easier to demonstrate some of this. But yeah, Mike, on that, uh, Sweden, uh, I was up in Sundsvall, which is about a four and a half hour drive from uh, you know the capital city. They're really heavy into reuse and recycling up there. They have incredible recycling centers where you can take everything and separate it out. So uh, overall, the country is on, uh, into the zero waste concept. It's just that they got stuck with those incinerators and now have to import from other European countries to feed those beasts. I've heard that the dioxins that we all worry about are the incineration are to worry with the new, new technology. Is that anywhere close to true? Um, the only thing that's close to true is that there's been, as industry loves to brag about, they have a memo from EPA from, I think it was 95, um, or no, 2005, sorry, decade ago, um, that says that there's been a 99% reduction in dioxin from trash incinerators, and they pat themselves on the back really hard for that. Well, I've studied this and compared to the entire coal industry in the U.S., all the comparisons you can make between burning trash and burning coal and how polluting they are, after all that 99% reduction, they are still 28 times worse than coal plants are in terms of dioxins per amount of energy produced. And there are some caveats in this. One is that they don't really know what's coming out because they don't test all the time to see what's coming out. They test for six hours a year for dioxins oh. under best operating conditions. So this is how most pollutants are regulated. We're talking about most things with smokestacks in our country. We really don't know what's coming out day to day except for usually three pollutants. Carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides. For those who know what's really coming out minute to minute because they have continuous emissions monitors. But any company with a smokestack to sell you will give you the same song and dance. And I've talked to people I've never even met before. They call me up and say, Mike, we need help fighting this thing. They're trying to build in my town. I'm like, did they say this? And I'm like, that's exactly what they said. How do you know? So it's the same song and dance. And it goes like this. Companies will say, we're going to have continuous emissions monitors on our smokestack. We'll know what's coming out at all times. That data will be reported live to the state. And they'll make sure that we don't go over any of those limits. And if they do, we'll be fined very heavily. And so trust us, and um, we'll be within those limits, and those limits are healthy and safe. Have you all heard that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's everywhere. Anyone with a smokestack to sell you will tell you the same, to the same thing. And every bit of that is misleading or outright lying. And so to deconstruct that, the first thing to understand is just that they don't use continuous monitors for much of anything. They use it for those three pollutants, 
plus opacity, which is an indirect way of looking at uh, particulate matter, so how dark the emissions are. And the regulations on that usually don't apply at nighttime. They will also look at oxygen temperature on a regular basis. And they'll use some of these, like oxygen temperature, to pretend they know how much dioxin is coming out, but they really don't know because there are many other variables involved other than just oxygen temperature to really know what the dioxin emissions are. So in one study I've seen out in Europe, they found when they use continuous monitors for dioxin and get a full picture the, around the whole calendar year, they find that the real emissions are 30 to 50 times higher than what that six hour a year test makes you believe. So for not just dioxin, but mercury, lead, arsenic, all these other toxic chemicals, hydrochloric acid, rarely continuous monitor mercury, some of the new ones that are getting permitted are required, but none of the existing ones have it. So for most things, you have no idea for any toxic chemicals what's really coming out on a day-to-day -day basis, except for under best operating behavior. It's like having a speeding limit, where you set a speed trap one day a year, and you have signs coming up that say, watch out, speed trap is set ahead, slow down, and all the drivers know to slow down, and the brother of the driver is running the speed trap, because the companies hire their own consultants to do the testing. So there is no surprise inspection when it comes to this. Some companies like Caverta, the biggest incinerator operator in the US, has actually been caught in one case I found in their own self-reported um, batch of violations that they were tampering with their continuous emissions monitoring equipment to make it look like their emissions were lower than they actually are. Mm -hmm. And thankfully they got caught at least one time for that. Um, who knows how many other times this is happening and they're not being caught. So it's, it's a lot of a scam. They really don't know what's coming out of the stack most of the time, but they act as if they know all the time. And you really just need to undress that by asking them which pollutants and why are you not using the state-of-the-art monitoring technology that exists to test over 40-some pollutants on a real-time basis, throw that information up on a website. If you're so proud of your technology being so clean, you have nothing to hide. You won't mind doing this. But they will not do this. They would go with this idea. Um, you can basically stop these facilities by requiring them to actually test what's coming out of a smokestack on a real-time basis and tell the world. They won't do it because they know they have a lot to hide. Uh, what I might just add to that is, um, so there's a company called Green Conversion Systems, and they make the claim on their website that the temperatures that they operate at do not form dioxins, that it's too high. And when you check and you do some research, you do a fine research that verifies that, that you have to be at a certain temperature, and there has to be oxygen pres present to form dioxins. And in the technology that they use, they have neither condition. So okay, you just remind me the other part of the question I failed to answer, so thank you, and I'll make sure I get to that too. Okay, so to finish answering your question, and I'll get to this. Um, that 99% reduction that EPA talks about and has in that memo, um, most of that is because a lot of incinerators were shut down. That's not a reduction in terms of a rate. It's not saying the overall um, amount coming out per amount of waste burden or per amount of energy got reduced. It's saying the total absolute number of dioxins coming out of incinerators in the U.S. went down. Well, that's because the total number of incinerators went down by a lot. Over 100 of them were shut down. Um, I'm trying to remember the numbers. At least, it was at least 70-something. I'm trying to remember if it was 170-something. I mean, it went from, in the high hundreds, I think it was over 100, shut down between the peak around 1991 when they had about 100, close to 180-ish incinerators operating to now when they have about 80. And some of the ones that shut down were ones like in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where in 2000, 28% of all the dioxins in the country's trash incinerators came out of that one plant. And that's because they had this old style pollution control device that actually formed dioxin in the pollution controls. It was, there were several of these types of incinerators. Columbus, Ohio, almost even worse than that shut down in 94. And there were a number of that operated this way, and they had just astronomical levels of dioxins. So if you shut these really pathetically dirty ones down and enough other ones down, it's easy to get a 99% reduction. But the fact that they're still 28 times worse than coal plants, if you look at them on a levelized basis, like the same amount of energy being produced from each plant, which one is dirtier, even though coal plants were built a couple decades earlier and don't have the pollution controls that trash incinerators tend to have, um, the fact that trash incinerators are that much dirtier, even with extra pollution controls, says a lot about the fuel and how filthy it is. Okay, so your question. Dioxins are formed at relatively low temperatures. 
they're formed basically between um, 240 degrees Celsius. That's about 350 to 750-ish uh, Fahrenheit. So they're burning at temperatures higher than this. Dioxins are not destroyed in incinerators because a lot of the dioxins aren't even there in the waste to begin with. So it's really a matter of them being formed in incinerators. And they're formed when things are cooling down. So it's not a question of how hot do they burn. It is, it is true that before it's super hot, you know, the precursors, the things going in that are almost halfway to dioxin, you know, some of those can get broken up. But most of the formation of dioxins is really about how fast things are cooling down. And that's the air emissions and the ash. So they'll use what are called quench systems to cool things down through that temperature range faster. And that's where you had things like Harrisburg's incinerator forming all these dioxins in the pollution controls because they didn't do that. They actually kept the air emissions, um, the exhaust, in that temperature range longer. And that's how they just have these astronomical levels of dioxin being formed. So you have a few factors. You have the speed at which it's cooling down through that temperature range. You also have the presence of oxygen is necessary to make dioxin. The presence of chlorine or other halogens, which it's great to have this atomic chart. <laughs> so things in this row here help form dioxin. I'm sorry if the camera can't see, but fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, that's where those are halogens. And chlorine is the worst one that we know about. So dioxins, we're also often talking about chlorinated ones, but you can you have variants on it that are made with fluorine or bromine. And so you need those in there to make them. And what also helps is having catalysts that help form dioxins. And so certain metals, like copper especially, and also iron and zinc, put a little bit of that in there, and your dioxin emissions go way up. And so when they're estimating what dioxin levels you have, when they're just looking at temperature and oxygen going in or at a certain point in the process, they can't tell all these things, because they're not measuring all these other things that aren't so easily measured, like the exact molecular composition of what's going in on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. They don't know that. So there are a lot of variables, and they can't account for that all. So some processes don't add oxygen. So there's some types of incinerators, like pyrolysis types of facilities, that are starved oxygen types of facilities. So um, you, I'm not going to assume you all know what pyrolysis is, so I'm going to break that down a little bit. No pun intended. Um, so combustion, where's a piece of paper? Hold this up for a second. It's so, right here. I just, I just need a little paper. So, if you light this paper on fire, which we're not going to do here because I'm against all combustion, um, you will notice that the flame is not actually coming off of the paper directly. There will be a little gap between the paper and the flame. Mm -hmm. And that gap is the gas is being formed from the heat. And so, all combustion is technically gasification. First, you're turning the material into a gas, and then you burn the gases. So even a conventional incinerator is doing this two-step process, but in one big vessel. However, you can have this new type of incinerator that they will insist up and down is not an incinerator. They will fall on a sword over this, and it's ridiculous, but, um, but they are incinerators, and they're defined and regulated as incinerators by the federal government. But they operate a two-stage process, so they basically put a pipe between the first step and the second step. So they turn things into a gas in one chamber, and they'll say, oh, there's no oxygen in that chamber, so we can't make dioxins and they're not combusting anything in that chamber, so we can't make dioxin. And there's some truth to, well, to the second part. And then they'll put it through a pipe, and they'll go to the second part of the facility where they burn the gases. And so if you look at it as a whole thing, it's an incinerator. Now, there are other types of facilities that can take the gases and not burn them and turn them into liquid fuels. And so there's like solidose ethanol types or refineries. We don't like them much either, but they're not as disgusting to live next to as an incinerator is. And so technically, they're not actually incinerators because they're not burning the gases. But if they're doing that in second stage, the whole process is still an incinerator. And there still is enough oxygen to make dioxins because in that first step, even though they're not adding excess air, and that's where they get away saying, oh, there's no oxygen. Well, I've looked at the numbers for what the chemicals coming out of that first stage, and they often like to erase all the toxic things. So the halogens, the metals, all those are invisible, and any information you get about this, they just magically disappear in this first step. But so in that pipe between them, they say it's just syngas. And the syngas is just CO and CO2 and some hydrogen, safe hydrocarbon stuff. And they want you to think that that's all that's in there. Of course, the mercury, the arsenic, all those things are in there too. They don't vanish. They can't be destroyed. They're elements. Um, but if you look at the oxygen in there from the CO and CO2, and I did this on a plant they're trying to build the world's largest um, 
trash pyrolysis plant in this little town in Logansport, Indiana, 6,000 tons a day. The company has no idea what they're doing. It deals with farming, by the way. Um, the biggest one in the world is 400 sometimes a day, so the you know, technology doesn't even work on that very well. But their data on what's in that syngas, if you add up those no oxygen molecules and see how much of the weight of the stuff coming out of that first chamber is oxygen, it was 20%. And so they say, no oxygen in there. I'm like, well, you have 20% oxygen molecules coming out. They're just connected to carbon molecules. So you have the ingredients you need for dioxin right there, and you're operating in the temperature range or close to it for what you need to make dioxins. You're just not going to form them all there. You'll form some of them later on. But they can and do make dioxins. Some of them make dioxins more than normal incinerators do. And there's data out of Southern California where they had a pyrolysis facility running for a little while on trash and they found high dioxin levels with that as well, even compared to the normal trash incinerators that have in Los Angeles City. Can I ask a really dumb question? What Farming is the material you, you get the accent from? Is it burning anything, or is it burning certain kinds of materials that turn to trash? Um, I don't understand ooh, that yet. This is going to be fun. Okay, I'm going to give you all the time to this. If we can find a marker. Is there a marker around somewhere? Uh, no, I know a marker. Okay, this is fun to draw, but um, we can't do that. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. This is yeah. Make sure. Oh, okay. Let's not do this. Okay. We're gonna use our imagination. Yep. Um, or maybe we can draw on the back or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here, let's use that marker. Okay, so how many people heard of benzene? Great. What's benzene? What's it made of? It's rings. Okay, rings. Benzene is a hexagon, right? Mm -hmm. This is the symbol they use to represent benzene, but if we were being technical about it, we would put a C at each one of these corners. So six carbons connected in a hexagon. And coming off of each one, we put an H for hydrogen. So C6H6. And you get exposed to this when you fill up your car with gasoline, and benzene vapors come off. And it's toxic, causes leukemia and stuff. You don't want to breathe this all the time. But, um, but that's one of the main building blocks of dioxin is benzene. And so if you just take this and start playing with it, you can get other fun chemicals. So say we put. <coughs> put a chlorine instead of a hydrogen on one of those corners of a benzene molecule. All of a sudden we have chlorobenzene. All right? Let's put another one on. Now we have dichlorobenzene. It's not so complicated, right? Um, two chlorines, benzene, dichlorobenzene. And, and you can put them in different configurations. You can put the chlorines in other places and get one three dichlorobenzene, one four dichlorobenzene. So when you see all these chemicals that sound all scary, you know, it's not too difficult to figure out how to draw it. So if you take this and draw a connection to another one. And you put another benzene connected to it like that. You've all heard of PCBs, right? Mm -hmm. What are PCBs? Polychlorine <coughs> biphenyls. Biphenyls, right. Mm -hmm. And who invented these? Monsanto. Monsanto. <laughs> it was banned in 1966. It was a very terrible chemical. It's contaminated a lot of stuff. Um, so ben or PCBs are very chemically con connected to or related to dioxins. They're very um, closely linked. So if we take this now and put an oxygen in between, and we'll throw another, throw chlorine on. So we can connect them with one oxygen in there, all of a sudden we have furans. You heard of furans? Mm -hmm. They're usually in the same sense as dioxins, because they're almost the same. And then if you, instead of directly connecting one of them, put another oxygen in there, so it's connected with two oxygens, that's dioxin. And so you can build dioxin with any kind of hydrocarbon. So this paper is hydrocarbons, plastic are hydrocarbons, food waste, all that stuff, and the incinerator is made of hydrocarbons. And then you just need chlorine, which if this paper was bleached with chlorine, is already in there. Um, if you have PVC plastic, those vinyl plastics, um, Barbie dolls, PVC coated um, copper wire, is a great recipe for making dioxins. You have the copper there, that's a catalyst for dioxin formation. 
Um, so all those things have the ingredients. So most things you burn that are burnable, you're going to have the, the hydrocarbons, the oxygen will be present even in the outside air and in things that are in the waste itself. And you have some kind of halogens like chlorine in there. And you'll probably have some catalysts that help form this. And if you want to see the most toxic chemical known in the science, it's this. So you have 2378, which just says where they put the chlorines on there. Tetrachloro, because there are four chlorines. Dibenzo P dioxins, the full name of it is. They call it 2378 TCDD. And this is the most toxic type of dioxin you can have. And if you just rearrange where the chlorines go and how many you have, you have different types of dioxins. If you take one oxygen off, you have different types of furans, and then you have your whole family of dioxin-like chemicals. And they'll come out in all kinds of different amounts and different variations, and you add them all up, and then you can get a total amount of dioxins coming out. And sometimes they'll use smaller numbers that are based on toxicity, and they'll say the toxic equivalents of dioxin, which gives you a better understanding of how dangerous it is, because if you alter where these chlorines are, you'll get variations that aren't as toxic. And so it's good to know if your mixture is more or less toxic, not just how much it weighs. Yes. Can some of these diocins be also in, in a geothermal? Can some of these diocins can be formed? Um, and there are a number of problems with geothermal, but I don't think dioxins are one of them because there's not a, a high enough heat or combustion process. For it, um, you have hydrogen sulfide emissions. There's been radon contamination here on the island as well from geothermal bringing up um, naturally occurring radioactive materials from underground. Um, but dioxins, I don't think, are a threat you need to worry about from geothermal. Yeah, Mike, I'm interested in how all this affects us here on the Big Island. And my question to you is a political one. The, uh, the mayor has turned the incinerator on, and then he's turned it off. And I wonder if, what experience you've had, what we can anticipate in the future. Well, it's not unusual for there to be a lot of salesmen waiting in the wings. I've seen a lot of fly-by-night companies running around, plus you have the big companies that actually do manage to build things or know how to do that. And they'll sucker local governments into all sorts of things. Um, oftentimes you have these little LLCs that have no history, but they'll say, oh, we have a plant in Moldova. It's, oh, well, don't really own that, but it was hard to get data from it. And, and that's a real situation. <laughs> we can tell with the Moldova example company. But you have these companies that have no track record that get some whiz-bang tech people with a new way of doing things that isn't incineration really, but it is. And you'll have investor types that team up with them. And they'll swindle local governments who want to make want to believe that they can make all the trash go away and turn into magically good stuff. And it could be energy that you put it into, which is not how it works, but that's what they claim. Um, they'll say they have no smokestack when they do, that happens a lot. They'll say there's zero emissions or zero waste when they're definitely not. Um, sometimes they'll be trying to make liquid fuels out of stuff instead of um, electricity, and instead of directly combusting it and converting their car instead. And all these are, a lot of them, are experimental. A lot of them don't work. A lot of them end up getting long-term monopoly contracts out of municipalities, sometimes 20 or 35 year contracts to supply waste or to buy energy, and then they'll go belly up or not work anyway. And sometimes they'll get as much as half a million in consulting fees or more uh, just to pay their consultants, come up with things that don't work out, and here you are five years later after citizens have had to fight the government over this, and their deal falls apart and they're back where they started, but so many years later with the landfill that much fuller, and still no solution. So this happens far more often than any actual solution comes out of any of these. And even when they manage to build anything um, of any commercial scale, which hardly happens at all um, in the US, we've seen one large scale new trash incinerator be, incinerator be built in the last 20 years. Um, that is at an existing site, but if you look at ones where there hasn't been one already, they haven't gotten one built in close to 20 years at any commercial scale. So really, this is the, one of the most unpopular industries on the planet. They succeed less than 1% of the time in actually building these things. But in much higher percentages, they get local governments to su get suckered into these contracts that just feed consultants and don't actually come up with anything useful. So I wouldn't be surprised if the government gets suckered into some other magical black box trick. But um, it could just as well be that you have some big corporation come in here and get a big contract to say, oh, we're going to do zero waste, or we're going to recycle it, or we're going to take all the materials to some other continent, or not produce the jobs here and leave the materials um, here to produce those jobs. 
So really, you want to do something that keeps things as local as you can, gets the economic value out of that waste, and keeps those local, small-scale, decentralized, publicly owned cooperatives or other things that keep it out of this big privatized waste industry sector. Mm -hmm. I'm a little off the subject, but there's a um, biomass plant being built, Kuhonua. They say they're going to burn wood to make energy, and some of the wood might be soaked with salt water. Yeah. That's where you got your dioxins from. Um, you'll also get dioxins just from the chlorine that's naturally in the wood anyway. One of the things that really shocks me, we actually run the nation's grassroots network of folks fighting biomass incinerators. The first um, biomass incinerator I actually fought, and Tracy and I worked together in Stockholm in 1997. And so we know a bit about this. And in a report that I'm working on about the environmental justice implications of biomass incinerators, which is turning into the Bible biomass document that I hope to have out in a few months, um, if, I, if we're lucky, um, I found that the metals in the trees, even if you're growing fresh trees, we're not talking about construction and demolition wood waste that's been painted and treated and is full of toxic chemicals that were added to it. Just straight trees from a forest has metals in there at levels that in Europe, if they use the same test that they use to test whether coal ash is hazardous waste, wood ash would qualify as hazardous waste because the metals concentrations are that high. If you think about where all the contaminants from industry go, all the coal plants, all the incinerators, all that stuff put into the air over time, trees are sucking that stuff up. Some of them are hyperaccumulators and are very good at sucking up these metals out of the ground. So you just start burning trees now. It could be a campfire, it could be in your home, or it can be in a giant industrial scale biomass incinerator. And those metals are coming back out and they're gonna end up in the air and in the ash like everything you feed into an incinerator does. Oh, biochar may not be so good for your soil. Uh, and biochar is not good for soil, yes. Biochar is a scam. It's not a global warming solution. Um, it's a type of pyrolysis, actually. Um, well, actually, it is pyrolysis, just applied to trees or increasing they want to call everything biochar. Biochar is the new name for charcoal. It just sounds better when we call it biochar. Um, and you produce, because you're operating at those lower temperatures, products that make complete combustion, things that cause cancer, like PAHs, will be present in there. You don't want to feed soils with this. You don't want to try and chop down forests to do this and then somehow pretend you're solving global warming. Uh, it doesn't work and it's not a good idea. What about that? Would well, you say that in a little bit? Um, I didn't know they're making RDF on Yes, they are. They well, they'd, they'd like to. to. They'd like okay, to. This is a proposal. Okay. Yeah. Um, Would you explain so just uh, on the biochar yeah. one yeah. more time? I sure. So maybe I can. Okay. One that was level. shocking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roll it back. <laughs> Rewind. All right, we'll what, you, what you said, I didn't get it. Okay, well, let's do After the biochar yeah. first because I'd yeah. like to hear that again too. Okay, so we have a number of people who look to this um, historic idea of native folks in the Amazon using some kind of underground, like burning of wood in an oxygen starved situation that's somewhat similar to pyrolysis, to make um, a charcoal out of it and then feeding soils with that um, carbon-based material. Now, that's, that's what they're, they're pretending they're emulating this, like, look, the indigenous people did it, it's good, it made sense, it fed their soils, it made them rich. Um, so now they want to take pyrolysis machines that are doing a similar type of thing, but they're types of incinerators, and they want to feed trees, trash, anything they can into them so they can produce um, air pollution. That's not why they say that, but that they will produce air pollution just like any pyrolysis plant does. And they'll produce a solid material like a slag, which is similar to incinerator ash. And they call that biochar because it sounds better than charcoal. And technically it's not coal, so you know, there's some legitimacy to say it's a, it's a bio and not a fossil fuel thing. Unless you're talking about trash, in which case you have a lot of plastics going in. In that case, it's not so bio anymore. But they have this idea that you then take this um, slag or biochar and you mix it in with the soil. And there's been um, a study out of Canada showing that when you mix this in the soil, it's supposed to increase the amount of carbon in the soil. And their theory is that if you do enough of this, you cut enough forest down and turn it into biochar and put that in the soil and then you grow new forests and you keep doing this, then eventually you're taking carbon out of the air and putting it into the soils. Regenerative organic farming actually can do a good job at that. You know, plants are, in general are good at taking carbon out of the air and putting them into the soils. 
Um, but big pyrolysis machines definitely are not the way to go in this. And the study in Canada, they found that it actually wasn't increasing the carbon in the soil, that it, so a lot of it was blowing away anyway. And I haven't studied this enough to know if that's across the board or if that was just that one study. But there's a group called Biofuel Watch that has done a lot of work on biochar. And if you look up their website or go to our incineration page, we have a link um, that will get you to information on that. Um, you'll see that they've done a, a whole report or two on biochar and why that's a problem. Is that, is that what's called sequestering? Sequestering carbon um, in the... Uh... It's a type, you can argue that's a type of carbon sequestration. Um, a lot of carbon sequestration schemes are um, not very good at doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, some of them are, actually most of them, if you're talking about like the clean coal, which doesn't exist, but the, the so-called clean coal plants that take, um, they gasify, so it's a type of incineration, um, but applied to coal. You're gasifying the coal and then you burn those gases and in that process, you can capture some of that CO2 and then pipe it a long way, and expensive pipelines, then bury it underground. And usually, rather than try to bury it underground in places that it might theoretically stay there, they want to make a profit off of this, so they use what's called enhanced oil recovery. And so they'll pump it into old oil fields that can't produce any petroleum anymore, and they'll pump that CO2 underground so they can force more oil back up, so they can burn that oil. And then you end up with more CO2 in the atmosphere. And the CO2 they're pumping down also comes back up with that oil. So it really it doesn't make sense. They're not really sequestering in the long term sense with that. So RDF, should we get to that now? OK, so how many people know RDF nerves? What, what? Oh, what is that? No one. OK, that's why we're going to explain it. Good. She does. OK, so RDF is an acronym for Refuse Derived Fuel. And that's basically a fancy word for trash pellets. So if you take all your trash and send it to a refuse dry fuel plant, um, if you're lucky, they're probably pulling out the metals and the glass because they don't burn so well. So they'll pull those out and you'll get some recycling happening from that. And then they'll take the rest of it, most of which is also recyclable or compostable, a lot of paper and plastics, which burn well, and they'll make pellets out of them, and that's called refuse dry fuel, or RDF. And there are some very old plants around the country that are still doing this. Um, there are some new proposals that are trying to do this, like the parent in Maui and one in Baltimore that's going down the tubes fast. And these are pretty much just conventional trash incinerators which, with slightly less dirty fuel. But it's still filthy. If you look at the data on refuse dry fuel burners versus normal trash incinerators, the emissions of everything are almost just as high. They're just a smidgen lower on some things. Uh, so it's not a big step forward by any means. Do justice to that. What about claims that ash, bottom ash, that come from incinerators can be used in concrete? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know anywhere that's actually succeeding in doing this, but they love to talk about it because all companies want to sound like there's zero waste, and so incinerators even like to pretend there's zero waste and say, oh, our ash isn't going to go to a man for us. Good. Everyone loves it. It's going to be used for building roads and buildings and playgrounds and whatever. They will try to act as if all their waste products are useful things that the market is demanding. And then, if they actually get the thing built, you find out that's going to a landfall because no one wants it. So there are a few cases where they tried building parking lots out of it, building roads with it, um, building okay, coral reefs, um, artificial reefs out of this. Um, they've done this in Bermuda, and they sunk um, bricks of incinerator ash down there. And um, they insisted when they go down and test underwater that nothing's leaching out. Um, I can imagine there are some problems with the way they did that study, but they, they insist that no toxins are coming out. And this doesn't make good cement. I mean, if you look at cement specifications, that you, it's not going to line up well with what's in incinerator ash. And when they had built this, like I think there was one example in York, Pennsylvania, they um, used it on a grade school's parking lot and it crumbled and they had to rebuild it. So a lot of the stuff in York, Pennsylvania actually ended up in, they were piling up in an old quarry and it was ending up piling up more than they were allowed to have because it just wasn't working the markets they wanted to have and they ultimately had neighbors suing and, and fighting over getting this big ash pile um, closed down as it was blowing ash into the neighborhoods. And efforts in Tennessee and Maine um, were also attempted by the same company, and, and that's all been shut down and hasn't really worked as far as I understand it. So um, what do you think we should do to 
to get towards zero waste in our current situation now? Okay, let's see if I can get some food. Okay, um, where's the other power plant I have? some front lights so we can make some of this visible? Yeah. Or maybe get it on a screen that the camera can see? Yeah, go ahead. Zero waste. So, we just got the fastest version of my incinerator PowerPoint. How do you want to see? We'll roll it back in one video and slow mo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is this program, do you have this on YouTube? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, there yeah. are some versions of, of me doing. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. There, yeah, there may be a version or two on YouTube, but um, yeah, we probably need to make a good one. <laughs> I don't yeah, know right now. Um, so, for zero waste, then, we'll go through some of the answers on that. So first, has everyone seen the definition of zero waste? You know what that is? It's right here now. Uh, it basically says that we're not going to burn or bury anything. And of course that sounds utopian, right? Because we're always going to have some waste. And whenever you bring this up to your municipal officials, the response is, that's unrealistic. That'll take us forever. And people are lazy and we're always going to have some waste. And you have to do something with this so we should burn it. Which is not a good conclusion to that statement. But, um, <coughs> Me. So if you're not for zero waste, how much are you for? <laughs> zero waste is not about literally getting to zero. So if you get hung up on, can we technically get to zero? You're going to have philosophical debates all the time, and you're not going to get anywhere. So to recognize that the point of it is to get as close as you can. It's kind of like having a zero safety defects policy, or a zero drug tolerance in school policy, or any of these zero tolerance policies. You don't expect you're actually going to hit zero. Um, zero workplace injuries, you know, but your goal is to get as close to that as you can. So you're not like, oh, well, let's injure five people a year. That'll be fine. You know, you're, you're trying to get to zero. So you want to have policies that get you as close to that as you can. Now, there's a lot of value in the waste stream, which is why we want to make sure any contracts here on the Big Island end up being ones that keep the materials as local as you can, because I'm sure there are people on the side who would like to have jobs. And they probably wouldn't like millions of dollars worth of material leaving the island so that would be ramp jobs. So if you look at the whole country like this group did in 2010, they found over $11 billion worth of recyclable, mater recyclable material was still being sent to landfills and incinerators even after all the recycling and composting is going on. So this is all kinds of paper, plastic, wood, goose scraps, metals, things that are valuable materials. So some places are coming up with resource recovery plans, like Austin, Texas is one of the best ones out there. It's about 300 some pages long. It's online, we have a link to it on our zero waste page, on energyjustice.net slash zero waste. And it starts with this page here. They came up with it about um, three, a little over three years ago. And they have a very ambitious goal of going over 90, 95% by 2040, with pretty high um, goals on the way there. And this is in Texas, where their disposal fees are very cheap. They have about $20 a ton landfill fees to compete with, and they find it viable to make this plan um, something that they're serious about. And they have no incinerators in Texas, so it's not even about that. And they have no shortage of land. So it's not like landfill space is going to run out, but it makes sense for them to do this. Other places like in Florida are doing resource recovery parks, and so they're co-locating different recycling and reuse industries in the same parks. So you can have the landfill next to recycling operations and the remanufacturing and all those things taking place in the same place. So you're not wasting energy trucking materials around and you can co-locate things so that one business's um, discards could be another business's food stock. Um, there are also some high successes like um, 
one of the biggest universities in the country, Ohio State University, they hit 98% diversion in one of their events at their stadium um, through the recycling that they did there. Now, of course, this is a very specific waste stream, and so they can have it controlled enough to do that. It's mostly like recyclable cans and bottles and things that people have. Uh, but still, to I mean, these aren't like your. This isn't a conference of like hippies and green activists, you know. I mean, these are Ohio State fans, so if they can do it. So, your overview of the of all the things you want to do is basically this. This is a zero waste hierarchy that I developed. This is the simple version. I'll walk you through the longer version in a second. And this is what the city of Oakland, California, um, well, actually the earlier version of this is that I wrote is what the city of Oakland, California, based their zero waste hierarchy on and what um, the Zero Waste International Alliance based their hierarchy on. And you'll see, um, it starts with the three R's. You have reduce, reuse, actually, it starts with an extra R for rethinking and redesigning. But then you have reduce, reuse, recycle. And recycle falls under source separated categories with um, composting, of course. And for the waste that you have, because most production systems, they have like a green bin, a blue bin, and a black bin. And so you put your compostables in the green bin, put recyclables in the blue bin. Now, if you're doing a good job and not using the single stream thing that makes the paper not so valuable, you probably want to put your paper separate from their bottles and cans. And then you have your trash bin, which should be a lot smaller, actually. And let me give an anecdote on this for a second. I have a friend in Tennessee who actually produces about one pound of waste a year. And there was a video on it. Someone did on Congress. I haven't seen that, but it's out there somewhere. And I heard of, um, more recently of uh, this 20-something young woman who produced a mason jar's worth of waste in two years. And at that point, I'm just like, all right, here I am doing all this zero waste work. I know I don't produce that much waste, but I really never measured, never held on to it to figure out what do I produce and why am I not at zero or like, how close can I get. So since New Year's, I've been holding on to all the waste I create. And in the past two months, I have probably about a plastic bag about this big, if I crunch it down, of waste. And that's mostly plastic film and adhesives, like tape and stuff, and like dental floss. So like, there's not a lot that you can't easily recycle. And if I had an outlet for plastic film waste, um, I'd have almost nothing in terms of waste. So it's not terribly hard to do this. Um, some of it is because I make the decisions when I go out and buy things to not buy things in packaging I can't recycle or compost, mm -hmm. or in things that, like get things that don't have packaging in the first place, which is helpful. But if people really try, they can do this. So that last part though, that waste that's left, you want to make sure you do the right things with it. And public officials that are lazy and think that their constituents are lazy are the ones that like to go to, oh, let's just burn it all because there's got to be something at the end here. And what we really need to do is be a lot more deliberate and not put it in a black box, but actually make it very visible. So there's another R in here for research. You need to look at what's left and see how did it escape the reduced reuse recycle categories and compost categories. And how can we put it back into those categories? You have to look at those things as failures and say, how do we end up with this stuff that's left? And can we come up with a way of recycling? <coughs> can we ban certain things, like DC just banned styrofoam? Um, we worked on that. California banned plastic bags recently, which is great. There are a lot of other places doing these. Um, so some things need to be banned, some things need to be redesigned, and some things need to just be more easily taken apart or more easily reused or figure out a way to actually recycle or, or compost them. So we want to look at the stuff, and then you don't, you, incinerators aren't even on this chart. You'll notice that has nothing to do with the zero waste plan. But you're still going to have an interim landfill until we can get as close to zero as is possible to get. And in that landfill, you don't just want to put stuff in that landfill because you're going to end up with environmental problems relating to that, from leachate, from air pollution. So you want to do that next step, which, which is to anaerobically digest what's there. You want to basically get anything that is organic material that belongs in the landfill that hasn't already been separated out by clean organics, like food scraps and yard waste. You want to get that earlier in the process and compost it. But you want to take what's left and digest it so you don't have a gassy, stinky landfill. That's very important because incinerators are bad enough for global warming. I'm going to shoot back here and show you how bad they are. This is a chart of CO2 emissions per unit of energy produced. And you'll see that 
And as much as we know coal plants are, are terrible culprits for global warming, burning biomass, like we were just talking about, is 50% worse than coal per unit of energy. So if you put a thermometer on a biomass burning, a wood burning smokestack versus a coal smokestack burning, they're producing the same amount of energy. You can't say burning the same amount of stuff because you have to burn twice as much wood to get the same energy as coal. Um, so you get 50% more CO2 with a biomass burning. Now, the trash incinerator, you get two and a half times as much CO2 per unit of energy. And some of that, the blue line is like the, the fossil fuel stuff, like the plastics burning, the tires, and whatever else is in there. Some of it is the biogenic part. And so the industry likes to say, oh, we're carbon neutral. Actually, we're carbon negative. We produce negative amounts of CO2. And the incinerator industry actually expects people to buy this nonsense. Um, public officials do. And actually, the US EPA recently did, which is really appalling. But, the fact is they only can do that if they pretend that that biogenic part doesn't exist. And they can only do that if they fall for this like carbon neutrality of biomass argument, which is debunked repeatedly. Um, it's been debunked numerous times in recent years. Because it takes, just for the biomass, it takes about 45 years for trees to regrow and suck up that extra pulse of CO2 so it's as bad as coal. And it takes hundreds of years <coughs> to approach carbon neutrality, which never gets reached. We don't have that kind of time. So trash incinerators are so much worse than coal from the climate. For that reason alone, we just should be doing away with that. But the fact is that landfills are even worse. Trash incinerators are worse than landfills on everything except global warming and land use, if you want to argue that we're running out of land. But generally, that's not an issue. And the only reason landfills are worse is because we mismanage them when we put organic materials into them without digesting them first. And that's why that last step is so important. We need to not let the incinerator industry win this argument that they're somehow better than landfills. They don't need to be better than landfills. They're filthy and they're way worse than coal plants. Just because landfills are currently worse because we dump all this organic stuff in them that makes methane is not an excuse. We need to manage landfills the right way and make sure they're not going to be gas either. Um, and that's not also be misled on natural gas. For the same reason that landfill gas is so bad for global warming, um, with the methane that's 86 times more potent than CO2 for the climate over 20 years, which is what the latest science says, not the 20 sometimes that EPA stick, still sticks to, which is 100 years in ancient science. Um, but natural gas um, is actually worse than coal for the climate too. These numbers are just if you look at the smokestack CO2. But if you count on the methane leaking out of pipes and whatnot, which is a lot, um, and it's not going to be able to be less than coal, you end up with levels that are actually worse than coal, so that methane. So, shooting back to zero waste. So that's why the stabilized digested residuals to landfill. That's the only thing that should be going to landfills. If you have that residual, that you got everything out. And in that waste part, you also want the cavity when you have extra recyclable stuff. So I forgot to point that out. So sometimes you'll hear about dirty MRFs. And everyone, everyone know what a MRF is? Why is this a MRF? No. No? Okay. Um, so a MRF is a material recovery facility, MRF. That's a fancy name for a recycling bin. And this is where they take your bottles and cans and papers and plastics and they separate them out. And sometimes people are hand picking things, sometimes machines, it's usually a combination. So a normal material recovery, recovery facility or MRF um, is where they take your source separate recyclables and run it through that process. A dirty MRF is where they take all your trash, recyclables, trash, all the stuff mixed together and run it through this process and try to get recyclables out. Now, it should be no obvious that that's going to come out with pretty dirty recyclables that aren't going to be recycled effectively, especially the paper is going to get very contaminated. So you don't want to let them do what Houston has been pushing to do and some other cities are trying to move toward, which is to stick, take a step backwards and tell people, don't separate anything, throw it all in one bin, and we'll get it out with robots and stuff. Well. That doesn't work very well, it gets very messy, and this is the, the lazy version of waste management, and that's what they call dirty MRFs. So what you want to do is you want to still sort of separate all this stuff so you can have high value, job producing stuff coming out, and then the stuff that you fail to get people to separate voluntarily, then you use the, the same type of facility to extract extra recyclables, and then digest what's left and put it in so that's the complete zero waste system. If you want to make sure you get the back end done right, you want to just have to make sure all these steps are there. Okay. Explain it under the digestion. Oh, okay. Um, 
Anaerobic digestion is basically composting in a vessel. So normally, if you compost stuff, you want to do it aerobically. So you have oxygen present, so you produce some CO2, but you're not going to produce methane. Methane you get when it's an anaerobic situation, so you don't have oxygen. And so when you dump a bunch of stuff in a mountain and make a mantle out of it, you have an anaerobic situation, you get a lot of gas produced that's about half methane, half CO2, and then hundreds of toxic chemicals that are contaminating it. And they pretend it's just methane, they want to burn it for energy, which is actually worse than not even burning it for energy. I know that's counterintuitive. Uh, visit our website um, on the ample gas and you'll find why. Um, I'll get to this um, I want to make sure I answer the rest of that. So, so NAMPO is when you're, when you're creating methane outdoors, you can't contain it all, you can't capture it all, and that's part of the problem, is that you have all this gas that escapes into the community, and you get more gas escaping when you mismatch the landfill as if it's an energy facility and try to burn the gas for energy. So digestion basically does that in a contained situation. So you can have digesters that are taking that organic material, letting it break down so you can capture those gases, and then you can burn them for renewable energy if you want, although we don't think they should be getting renewable energy credits and be competing with wind. But you can still do that to manage the stuff, and then what you have left isn't going to get gassy in a landfill because it already did its gassy thing in a vessel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is the work of Paul Stamets on the uh, remediation of hydrocarbons involved, included in your program anywhere? Are you aware of it? I'm not aware of it, so... He's the mushroom expert up in the Northwest, and he was, uh, what I read about is a contest, so to speak, where uh, hydrocarbon waste piles were uh, each given to him and other contestants, three or four others at least, and uh, his mushrooms and mycelium completely digest the hydrocarbons. Uh, I don't know if it's anaerobically, but it's without sunlight. They cover them up with tarps and the mushrooms yeah. do their thing and it turns into good soil. That's cool. Might be interesting to add it in your program. Okay. Can we do it again? Paul Stevens. Paul Stevens. Okay. Yeah, check in that. That sounds good. Um, what about, um, just on in terms of the landfill, um, I mean, I guess there's one suggestion that they're talking about in the state legislation, like putting, um, allowing the use of glass to do that cover layer. So every time they do a new bunch of put in more trash, then they do a cover layer. And they're talking about putting glass. But then at the same time, I look around and say in Thailand, every day they put in there all of the trash, they do uh, spray the whole thing with microbes to start breaking down. So they're constantly working on breaking down all of the organics. And then, so then I worry, well, if we were to start doing the glass, by the time we get to doing that, what Thailand and a few other advanced countries are doing, um, will that glass sort of undermine or inhibit the use of the, uh, uh, deter the use of the microbe? Yeah, we don't want the microbes to cut themselves in the grass. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Grass is pretty inert, so it's probably not going to mess up the microbes. And in fact, it probably has some, some contaminants from food and drinks in there that they'll like to eat. Um, but you're still throwing grass on landfill, and that makes no sense. Um, grass is infinitely recyclable, but it's heavy, it's breakable, and the industries basically for recycling that have not panned out very well, especially because they need to make sure they have the right color of glass being kept separate so they can do it. So unless they can separate it well, it's hard to have good value of glass in a recycling context. Um, oftentimes, if it doesn't get thrown directly into a landfill, they'll downcycle it, which what you're talking about is a more extreme form of downcycling. And when I say downcycling, I mean reusing or recycling stuff in a way that has much less value than what you started with that can't be turned back into the same product. Sometimes they'll turn it into glass fall, um, so you have these glittery roads that are asphalt with glass mixed into it. Um, there are, I'm trying to remember some other things they tend to do with it, but um, if you can get the glass separated and going into an industry that actually reuses it, that's the ultimate, or recycles it in a genuine way, that would be really preferable to putting it in as landfill cover. Right, that's what my thought. Is there a question back there? So, 
you have a compost pile that you never stir, like I don't, I just dump everything there, is that doing anaerobic digestion that sends bad things into the air? Um, yeah, if you keep it not stirred up, it, some of it could possibly go anaerobic and you could have some methane coming out of that, so you do want to keep it aerated the best you can. So in terms of looking at these different, you know, redo, rethink, reduce, reuse, source, from the position of the county government making this happen, um, sort of what are there particular um, places that have good uh, sort of examples? I mean, I know San Francisco overall, but just um, other places and your experience in sort of doing that timeline and step by step or... Yeah, I would look at some of the plans that are on um, this website here. Just it has links to some of the programs in various cities in California, which are ahead of the game, um, to the Austin, Texas one, and I can also put you in touch with. I think you, it's not, I think you're already in touch with some of the consultants um, out in California, mostly that have helped our local governments develop some of these policies. Um, there are some of the forward thinkers on this that can really uh, just help you know step by step how to get there. Um, I can put you in touch. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the energy justice aspect, because <coughs> what we saw here in our island is um, the idea, the proposal for this incinerator was to put it in an area that already hosts the airport, a very dirty power plant, um, a lot of emissions coming from a large shopping area where there's trucks coming in and out all the time and a lot of emissions from that, cars going in and out all the time. And this all happens to be land uh, that at one time was a continuous Hawaiian community but now got divided into two separate Hawaiian communities. And when the proposal came forward, there was no effort made by the people supporting it or <coughs> orchestrating it to go into those communities, talk to them, get their permission, get their approval. You know, so I, I, what I know about environmental justice is that this kind of thing happens a lot. And I wonder if you could share some of your experience about that. And before I do this, I saw someone escape. Uh, Tracy, can you start a side sheet and get it going around? And uh, <coughs> send follow-up information to anyone else. Um, and if you are, I've already got you the other night. Um, you know, I'm just saying again. I already have it. Okay, so let me go through some of the pieces of my um, presentation I have on environmental racism just to answer this question. Um, so, environmental racism basically is where communities of color are disproportionately impacted by polluting facilities. And that's just a trend we've seen in a number of industries. Um, there are exceptions to it, like coal plants tend to be in low-income white communities, biomass incinerators also in low-income white communities. Um, but a lot of times, you find that race is more of a factor than class and where facilities are done. And when we're talking about trash incinerators, on average in the U.S., it's actually in somewhat slightly above average income communities, but mu very much disproportionately in communities of color, more than most other industries, and particularly in black communities throughout the country. And I won't go through the whole history of this, but it's fun and interesting. And I'd love to give this presentation sometime. But let me point out some specific things. Um, one of them is that environmental justice, which is the movement's response to environmental racism, it's not about environmental equity. Nowhere in the principles of environmental justice that people came together in 1991, the first people of color national, first national people of color environmental leadership summit in DC, and came up with the 17 principles of environmental justice that define that term, and I'll show you them in a minute. Nowhere in those principles does it say, spread the pollution around better and we're cool with it. <laughs> it's not in there, you can't find it. Um, so the government's response, though, to the idea of environmental justice and to the demands of the movement has been to set up offices of environmental equity. They later changed those offices to be called environmental justice, but they kept their old definitions of equity, which basically means poison people equally, which is not our goal. So our goal is stop poisoning people, period, and that's what environmental justice is really about. It's a much more radical concept. 
America is a good word. It means getting to the root of a problem. This is EPA's definition of marmot justice. It's their old equity <coughs> definition um, reframed. But it's the same idea. Basically, it boils down to fair treatment and meaningful involvement. So as long as we don't deliberately discriminate against you, and as long as we have hearings where we ignore you like we ignore everyone else, then it's environmental justice. And that's essentially what EPA operationally has meant. Whether they claim that's what they mean is another thing, but, but that's what their definition boils down to in practice. So you don't have to read all those fancy words. It basically is two phrases and it doesn't have any legal teeth to it. So, so we, I mean, there are legal teeth in terms of we can't like put in writing or say that, yeah, we're going after this community because they're this skin color. You know? Obviously, there are problems with that. But if you can't prove that they intentionally did it, they can get away with murder, literally, and they do all the time. Because unless you can prove intent, you have no right to sue them anymore. And it's really hard to prove intent. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing another story. You didn't see that. Um, where are the principal? Oh, I don't have a slide with that one. I thought I did. Okay. Um, so, one of the things in the principles of Marmot Justice is. Um, it's principle number seven, and it talks about aspects of democracy and decision making. And it talks about how there ought to be needs assessments in determining whether something ought to be built somewhere. And so the process that we normally have is we have bureaucrats and politicians approached by corporations that say, I want to build this here. And the po politicians and bureaucrats will say, well, the politicians will say, okay, how much are you going to give me? I'll give, give you some handouts and whatever, subsidies, and waive your taxes. And the bureaucrats in the environmental permitting agencies will say, oh, did you meet the requirements and pay us um, in order to review your application? Sure, okay, here's a permit. And nowhere in this process does the community get engaged and asked, is there a need for this? There was no needs assessment done. And after that, if the principles of environmental justice were written today, it would also include a second step of an alternatives assessment. So first you ask the question, is this needed? And maybe there's a need. Maybe there's a need to handle the waste or to produce electricity or to deal with some other problem. But it doesn't mean that their answer is the only answer. And so then you do an alternatives assessment and say, oh, what are the alternatives for this need to be fulfilled? And then let the community actually come to an educated, hopefully, decision on what they would like to see. And that would be a democratic decision-making model. We don't have anything close to that right now, and that's why we're still struggling for environmental justice, because we have decision-making processes that are not democratic. Mm -hmm. I hope that hits your question pretty well. And um, do you have any resources that people <coughs> in the Hawaiian community where this is planning to be built and might come back again later, resources of other people that they could, um, you know, network with and maybe get some support from if it did come back? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Energy Justice Network, which is my organization, actually is a support network for folks fighting incinerators and all sorts of other dirty energy and waste facilities. So especially, um, who mentioned the biomass? Um, okay. So in the biomass incinerator, we're definitely going to talk later about that. Um, and for anyone that's fighting landfills, incinerators, biomass facilities, um, fossil fuel burning plants, ethanol plants, geothermal even, we don't have a network on that, but we thought about it at one point, and we have a web page up on it that has some data on it. Um, so like, all the things that are undesirable in communities, we want to connect people up with other people who are fighting the same thing, who have been there, done that, and who have the expertise to help you win. And so some of it is that we provide just advice, tools, strategy, um, I mean, anything we can to help you win, and also plug you in with other people. So we have email lists on a lot of these topics, so you can use those to connect with other people. We also have a mapping project that you can use to find who else is fighting things. So these are all tools that we offer. And <laughs> those we're missing, they like to pack with us our brochures and our thing about the services that we provide. But for all of you who put your name down on that sheet, I'll make sure to follow up and you all have all the details on what kind of tools and things that we offer. And is this PowerPoint you have right here something that you can send in an email? Yeah, send a link to it. It's up on our website already. It's and up on your website already? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, we have a resources section that has a PowerPoint section, and in there um, is a link to environmental justice presentation so you that you're looking at now, and the incineration presentation, which I showed you a minute ago. Um, now that I... Um, 
gave you a sneak peek of another slide on here. Um, I'm thinking of telling you a story. Uh, <laughs> I told some people I'd do this, so I'm going to do this because it's fun. Um, so the story starts with when I was an undergrad, and I saw a pickup truck that had two bumper stickers on it. And one of those stickers was a pro-logging sticker. It was like, have you hugged a logger today, kind of thing. And the other sticker just had three words on it. It just says, Smokey needs you. And that's all I said. And I was blown away by not only how the two stickers could be on the same truck, but how that second sticker didn't have a message on it. It was just three words. And it didn't say, like, who is Smokey? What does he need me to do? Who is Smokey? Smokey who? The bear. Smokey the bear. Okay, so Smokey's a bear. We know that much. What does he want us to do? Stop forest fires. Stop forest fires, right. So, so there's this mythical bear that wants us to do something, and we all know about it so much that they don't have to print his face or anything on the screen <coughs> or his message. They just have to say, Smokey needs you, and it's like a key to unlock an ad that's already in my head because I've heard it since I was wee big, right? So, there's obviously a lot of money behind this bear. Who funds Smokey the bear? Keep America Beautiful. Wow, you're, you might have read my article on this. But, um, no, I <laughs> They don't actually do it, but you're skipping ahead. We're the statewide recycling organization for Keep America Beautiful. So we... Okay, we'll get to Keep America Beautiful. We're not there yet. Um, so <laughs> it's not the Forest Service. They co-sponsor it, but what I'm looking for goes a lot deeper. Um, I'm going to give you a hint. The same entity that sponsors Smokey the Bear also puts out things that say, don't drink and drive, tutor kids after school, pick up your litter. The Ad Council. The Ad Council. Mm -hmm. So who the hell is the Ad Council and how do they have so much money to fund Smokey the Bear ads and all these other ads? Who is the Ad Council? The Bilderbergs. <laughs> no, they, they brag in recent years they brag that they have 400 impressions per year per person in this country that means you're seeing one of their ads at least once a day but you're the average person like looking at magazines billboards every media bus terminals like, they're, they're everywhere they're on the internet now so you see these a lot and a lot of times I'll ask people, and half my audiences don't even know, like no one even guesses the ad council. They're all seeing them more than once a day, on average. And, uh, so they obviously have a ton of money. Who funds the ad council? Yeah. Um, uh, multiple big industries. Multiple big industries. Yes, that's the best answer I'll ever get. That's exactly who funds them. So I once saw a full-page ad in the Philadelphia Inquirer, 1994, that said, and now a word of thanks to our sponsors. Thanks. I had this long logo on the bottom. At the backdrop of it was all this small print of all these giant corporations covering the whole page. And half of them were probably merged by now. But like, you have all these big corporations that I researched you know, a few years ago. And I wrote this article called Occupy Earth Day um, that you can find online. Oh, I can find it there. And I found that of the top 100 corporations in the U.S., exactly half of them have donated to the Ad Council in recent years. So, given that, what are they saying? What's their message? Don't burn down trees so we can cut them. I can't hear what. <laughs> she said, don't cut down the trees so we can burn them. <laughs> don't burn down trees so we can cut them. Right. <laughs> and then burn them. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't burn them in an uncontrolled manner. We need to make a prop up. Um, so yeah, there could be some of that going on. Um, but well, this goes a lot deeper. What's the common thread between all those messages that the Ad Council is putting out? Buy. Don't, don't worry about saying, big business. Is Smokey saying buy a forest or buy anything? No. Uh, so buckle your seatbelt. You know, what's bad about that? Oh, don't worry about big business. Is basically what it says. You know too much. That's great. Um, so, <laughs> yes, smoking the bear's exact message is what? Word for word. Smoking needs you. No. 
Only you can prevent forest fires. Yes. Dang, I dug deep for that. Yes. Right? That's so we hear this a lot. We hear since we're little. Only you can prevent forest fires. What's the most important word in that sentence? You. 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 Not us. That, not us. That's the key to the Ag Council strategy. That is actually one of the top five, well, they have five. They have five criteria on why or when they'll pick up a campaign, and one of them it has, is, is that it has to have an individual change focus. It's wired into the DNA of this group to be a blame-shifting tactic. That is the biggest public relations device our country has, and it's designed to take the heat off of companies like McDonald's that in the late 80s and early 90s actually had a campaign waged against them called the McToxics campaign mm -hmm. to when landfill activists and high schoolers teamed up and mailed the styrofoam clamshells back to Oak Brook, Illinois to their corporate headquarters until they stopped using them. They are designed to prevent that campaign from happening and so is Keep America Beautiful which is a mini version of the Ad Council. It is funded by who? Who would have an incentive to fund that Keep America Beautiful? There's a reason why they're listed in the Greenpeace Guide to Anti-Environmental Organizations. I'm horrifying Christine right now. Um, <laughs> so, Keep America Beautiful is an outfit that has opposed bottle bills before. I think they changed their tune on that, but they used to. Um, they have promoted incinerators. They, there are some other problems with them. I'm trying to remember and reach back. <laughs> I haven't read this a long time ago. But who would fund Keep America Beautiful? Who? Waste Management mm -hmm. is one of the funders. Who else? Home Depot. Probably. I'm not sure. Some um, of the biotechs. Um, I haven't seen that. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. But, but who has the most incentive to fund a group that tells you, pick up your litter? Don't blame McDonald's. Oh, oops, I gave away one. <laughs> um, don't blame these companies that are making the litter. Blame yourself. You're the cause of social problems. Your individual actions is the solution to social problems. It's the same ad council strategy, just not the corporation. It's, it's a libertarian point of view. The individual, yeah. not the big business. You have the packaging companies, the polystyrene packaging council will fund them, PepsiCo and Coca Cola funds them, yeah. the tobacco companies fund them. All the companies that you see when you pick up litter, you see their products. Next Those week. are the companies funding them. Next and water. the waste industry. Plastic water. bottles. Nestle Waters, eh? Plastic bottle companies, I'm sure, are, are huge right now in funding them. So these, <laughs> so these are the companies funding the groups that tell you that litter is your problem, not theirs. Mm -hmm. And it's a blame shifting device just like the Ag House. So it's important to understand this because this is relevant to environmental justice. If you look at the 17 principles of environmental justice, which I wish I had a hand out for, I usually do, but the 17th principle. Out of 17, and this was done on purpose, I talked to the people back in 1991 who wrote those principles and they affirmed that I was interpreting it correctly. That you have all these principles that talk about how the military and the government needs to change and big corporations need to change, and this last one is like, we as individuals should change our habits and be more sustainable and all that stuff. And it's the last of 17 principles for a reason. It's saying that we need to keep the onus on the institutions that are creating the big problems if we're going to get to environmental justice and not let them turn into a pick up our litter movement like they tried to do in the first, in 1970, the first Earth Day, you had Dennis Hayes, the student organizers, giving uh, passionate speeches about how we, sh we can't let the waste companies turn the environmental movement into a pick up their litter movement. Mm -hmm. And here we are, 40 years later, 45 <laughs> years later, and the companies have won. Like one of the main entryways into the environmental movement is to do litter cleanups and right. adopt a whale and plant some trees and do voluntary recycling and don't even institutionalize at your school. And all these things that don't challenge power and make you feel like you're doing something good. It's because you can see immediate difference, except when you graduate five years later, like this street you cleaned up near college is messy again and, and you haven't accomplished anything long term. So that's why institutional change versus individual change is very important for us to understand. And all of our work can't focus on, let's just educate people, or let's just do this voluntary recycling thing. If you're not institutionalizing that change, you're not making lasting change. And we don't have the time, as individual <coughs> activists working together in groups, to change things. We don't have time to change people one at a time when they're out there with the ad council and other ads, changing people millions at a time. We can't keep up with that. 
We need to change institutions in a strategic way that changes the options that people have, that gets us to the society quicker that we want to see. Now, and the, so to, let me just say, yeah, so yeah. that's why um, the whole, I keep thinking of the focus on the county, on the, sort of like the highest level community. And then you go from that level to the local communities, and then you go to the institutions, the schools, and then all the way down to the individual. And it's always, well, how much do we each of us recycle? And I'm sort of like, I consider that really not that relevant until people really have the opportunity mm -hmm. by having the county or whatever institution that is providing this solid waste um, program provides. And so then what I get, such as from environmental management and other people, is, well, really, Margaret, people on this island are really too lazy or too stupid or too disrespectful to make this work. You know, you can't, this is just the culture of just people. If you don't put it right there and you don't provide it, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to take that answer because that's what it is. It's putting it on us. The reason it'll fail is we're just litter bugs, okay, and we don't care. And rather than it be, no, if, if we provide it and make it available, opportunity, people will change. And that's what happened in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, the same kind of mentality was put on, how can we change a city? You know, how can we do that? That's insurmountable. They said, no, we're going to do it. And so, but they made it so that it really was, everyone there had the opportunity, whether, um, and worked with their kinks, they work them out. Yeah. So I just, uh, I, I appreciate that paradigm, you know, looking at it as, um, you know, where's the problem? You know, where's the problem? Well, we can't do this because Puanani's too lazy to go sort stuff out, you know. And, you know, or, you know, Corey, she just, it's inconvenient for her. She'd have to drive an extra mile. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. we shouldn't do it. Yeah, that blaming individual stuff is so convenient for politicians who are lazy and uncreative. <laughs> to blame their constituents instead of figuring out how to create the right incentives. But when you look at the places that create the right incentives, like the per bag types of programs, where you pay per bag like you do for every other utility, you pay for how much you use. But with trash, some, for some reason they don't do that in most places. But if you pay for how much you use, all of a sudden, on average, you get 44% reductions in the amount of trash people make per person. Mm -hmm. Almost instantly. And I've just seen the data on this. It's amazing. And, so, and who has that percentage? Where's the... Um, um, WasteZero.com. What is it? They're a private company that's promoting this program around the country. It's WasteZero.com. So they have a PowerPoint presentation I just saw recently, and I'm supposed to get a copy of it. Um, it has data from a whole bunch of communities, and on average they found 44% decrease. And that's just one tactic. There are all kinds of other things you can do to incentivize, pe incentivize people to be less wasteful, and that's just one of the many. Um, it's one of the most successful of many. Um, so I'm debating whether to seal your hands or to finish a juicy part of the end of that story. Um, should I do that? Are you going to remember? No, I'll remember your questions. Write them down. Write them down. <laughs> Write them down. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the fun part of the end of the story is um, I was a sociology major in undergrad, and one of the things I learned about is how the people in power stay in power. And now we know to call them the one percent, which is great. Occupy, it's been amazing on that. But they. Stay in power by dividing people. They divide people using racism, using sexism, using heterosexism, using guns and abortion, using all kinds of ways of slicing people up so they fight each other and not fight their bosses. And there was a great book I read, and I linked to it. Um, in this article. Um, it's called A Different Mirror, a Multicultural History of the United States. And it talks about the different ethnic groups that built this country. And in there, they talk about, a, a, wrote down the pages on this and kept it because it's fascinating, how the plantation owners back in the day would racially divide their workforces on purpose so they would fight each other instead of fighting their bosses. And they'll pay one group less than the other so that they can foment that dissent. And they did that in the South and in the, in the U.S., or in the continental U.S. Um, they did that here in Hawaii, too. And uh, one of the examples was actually from the sugar plantations here. And they had plantation owners that literally were sending memos to each other saying have this percentage of Japanese and this percentage of Filipino and situate them like this on the hills. And I believe that the expression of shit rolls downhill came from here um, because they had no sewer systems at the time. And so the bosses, of course, live on the top. And then they have one group and another group and they have no sewer. You can kind of figure out how that works. 
And so they engineer this very deliberately in order to foment the unrest because the Japanese laborers were doing enough labor organizing to really um, have an effect on their bosses. And so the bosses were like, oh, okay, let's get them hitting each other and we'll get rid of that problem. So, so that's deliberate. And that is just one of my examples of dividing people into groups in order to divide us. And they will divide us every way they can except for by class. Unless it's the middle class hating the poor, in which case it's cool. Um, you can do plenty of that. And hating immigrants and all that stuff. You know, they like that. Um, but if you have a 1% versus the 99%, that's so dangerous of a way of thinking that Obama has to coordinate crackdowns and occupy camps all around the country um, because we can't let that kind of thought form exist. So what is dangerous about the Ag Council strategy is that they take this divide and conquer tactic to the scientific perfection of getting, to the peop getting people to the point where they're divided into individuals and not even into groups. And that is so insidious that it affects all of our organizing. It affects how we operate. We're constantly battling people who are like, oh, why don't I just change myself and everything will be okay? Or why don't we do these voluntary projects? And it, it creeps into our organizing. That's why we constantly have to fight back against this and look back to understanding the story, understanding the principles of environmental justice, and understanding how to make institutional change and fight back against this tendency of people just to focus on themselves. That's my funny story. So, okay. So there was a question here, here, and here. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, one of my questions is on the other talk, and is um, are there a number of illnesses? Uh, created by using these products. Um, can you mention some of those illnesses? Is there a list? Yeah. <coughs> Back to my other presentation. Okay. Uh, let's talk about health impacts. These are some of the health impacts that have been tied to trash incinerators. Um, Tracy's been agonizing over every time I say, Tracy, we need a comprehensive list of health impacts from trash incinerators, because people keep asking me. And she's done a great job of starting to compile all these studies in the spreadsheet. And this is just some of them. This is not with all the extra stuff we've been compiling. But it's really hard to find any health impacts from anything, because these pollutants don't just come out of the smokestack and fall right on your house and go into your food and straight into your body and cause the disease like right then so you can know what happened. It's a lot more complicated than that. So some pollutants drop pretty close to the incinerator. Some go so far that when they studied, and um, Barry Connor, who's no longer with us, but he's an amazing scientist, uh, New York City, found, in a study he did in 2000, that the largest contributors of dioxin to eight sites in the Canadian Arctic were the incinerators in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and in Ames, Iowa. So, Dioxin can, can, dioxin can travel really far. And so sometimes people ask me, just recently I got like a question of, well, how many miles around incinerators really impact people? I'm like, you, I, that's unanswerable. Because some of these things go so far that, like when they first did the study to find a control group for PCB contamination in breast milk, they went to the Canadian Arctic and tested the breast milk of indigenous women up there and found not a control group. They found the highest levels they ever found. And that's because they're subsisting on animal fat in their diet a lot, and these things creep up the food chain. And globally, those types of dioxin-like pollutants distill and gravitate toward the poles. And then the animals move around, and you have all these things moving around too. So the fact is you have some pollutants that climb up the food chain, like methyl mercury, once it's methylated <coughs> again to fish, um, like dioxins, which also love fat and hate water. I'm going to show you some horrifying things on dioxins. Um, Ninety-three percent of your exposure to dioxin is from meat and dairy. So if you have an incinerator like in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or Lancaster, or York, all around the dairy belt in Pennsylvania, one of the biggest dairy states in the country, um, that milk, including the Hershey Kisses that you might eat that are made in that area, Hershey's based right there, um, are going to have dioxin from these incinerators. And this stuff is shipped all over the country. And so the fact that they can find health effects from incinerators at all is amazing because so much of the stuff is diluted into the general population because it gets into food and the food travels to people and people move and you have all these different factors where it makes it hard to even come up with a study that says this smokestack caused this in the population. It's very hard to find that. The fact that they found 
not always the strongest, but even weak correlations of some of this shows that there is definitely something going on. Um, but with dioxins, this is the chart that made me go from vegetarian to vegan. This is from EPA in 1994 when they did a reassessment of dioxin. And 93% of the dioxin they get is from being dairy products. And I didn't realize how extreme this was until I saw this chart. But dairy and milk are separate categories in here, and combine them as the largest source. And all of these are animal products. Inhalation, hardly anything. So you can live near the incinerator and dioxin exposure to it, you'll get some, but not as much as you get through eating. Um, soil ingestion is just dirt that you ingest, and water ingestion is negligible because it hates water and loves fat. If it ends up in living, landing in a water body, it's going to gravitate to the fat in the fish and stay there and climb up the food chain. It's not going to stay in the, and hang out in the water so it doesn't like water. It's called hydrophobic and lipophilic in the EPA studies. No, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, um, the, the, you know, plastic, the bottles that we drink water out of, I know, um, oh, my daughter, I have a daughter who's quite ill, and, and she was tested for all kinds of metals and toxins, and I, I was amazed how many, whether it's styrene or, I mean, different things that were, okay, where did you get this and this and this. Um, but um, even I, there's some community that just recently banned the sale of, um, of water to be sold in plastic bottles because of the uh, toxins in the, in the plastic. Yeah, we looked at that in San Francisco just banned um, selling bottled water on city-owned property. Oh, on what? Is great. On city-owned on... property. Yeah. yeah. Are we all carriers of plastic or what? Say that again? Yeah. <laughs> We're all carriers of plastic? Of plastic. Yeah, of chemicals in plastic for sure. Um, they find they, in uh, umbilical cores, they find 200 or more industrial chemicals, and babies are coming pre polluted anymore. Right, and I guess that there are certain, was it was talking about that with men and women, is that a lot of these chemicals don't, they just stay, you just, they're in yeah. your body, except that women lose a lot of them when they get pregnant and have a baby because it gets concentrated in the infant yeah. at really high concentrations and that's how the women uh, you know, ex expel yeah. a lot of toxins. So um, when we look in Kauai, I mean on the GMO where we've got all that pesticides and GMO, all these babies being deformed, I mean you just, where you have four seasons here versus one season other place, it just becomes understandable. Um, to add to the horrifying thing that you're talking about, um, there are two ways, well, okay, I'll do it by gender. Men cannot get rid of dioxin. You get it in your body, it's there every seven and a half years, you'll have half of the dioxin that you had seven and a half years ago. That's assuming you're not ingesting anymore, so you have to stop eating and breathing for seven and a half years, and then you'll have half, um, if you're still alive. Um, <laughs> so that's the biological half of the dioxin, seven and a half years. So, <clears throat> so you basically want to be vegan as much as you want to you can if you want to minimize your dioxin exposure. Um, but for women, there are two ways you can get rid of dioxin. Um, they both involve having a baby, and one is that it crosses the placenta into the growing infant, and the other is that it comes out through the breast milk. And a baby will get, I think, about one sixth or one something in the teens percent um, of its lifetime dose of dioxin just from infancy. Uh. Okay, now for the well, cherry side. <laughs> so, what recommendations do you have for us? Or one thing we were going over was if we have um, a program uh, doing diversion contracts, what are the kind of things that should be uh, preferences? And I think that's the kind of thing, uh, like on Tuesday, if we're discussing these contracts and trying to give out the contracts, what, what kind of, um, what do we want to look for? What kind of companies do we want? I mean, one thing that I tried to say is it shouldn't just be one company, and that it should be, in other words, um, diversion, that we should open it up and not just be bound like these little marriages. Ideally, it would be publicly owned. Second to that, it would be cooperatively owned by the workers. Um, ideally, it would be decentralized and not in some big private hands that are going to just take the economic value of all those goods and move them to some other island or continent, um, but keep that local and create jobs with it. Uh, so 
that's the, the gold standard if you can get there, just keep it in a more democratic space. Mm -hmm. I had all the questions, I know that you had questions, did I get well, to? Well, okay. my, my experience is just observational, but it seems to me, I've been here 30 years on this island, and it seems to me that the county has had a series of, of recycling efforts, which is <coughs> summarily crashed, um, over and over and over again, so that people get a little jaundiced about the whole process because it's been crashed so many times. You know, the composting was taken over by metal recycling, and then all, there was all this mush in the in the green waste. You know, that was not actually green waste, and nobody seemed to care. The county didn't care, and they gave the contract to, to people that didn't seem to have the ethics. I mean, it just seems like. Over and over again, you know, we found out that the that the stuff that was recycled was actually thrown away. Yeah, <laughs> in the yeah that, that, that happens recycled. a lot, and you really you need to have a good package of incentives because if you just do like I've seen in so many places, just in the airport on the way here, you know, you know, Tracy and I were like trying to recycle the cans that we had from the orange juice we got on the plane, and go and there there were recycle bins, and sometimes they're next to trash bins, which is a good first step. Sometimes they're by themselves, which is a terrible idea. And I looked at someone and it was like full of trash. And I went, what good, should I put this there? Because we're probably all getting thrown out. So you, there are a lot of psychological practices and settings. <coughs> There's education, that especially you get the kids while they're still in like young ages, you know, get them to actually understand what materials are made of, where they come from, where they go. Um, have them watch the Story of Stuff video. Um, how many people have seen that? It's amazing. It's like no, what minutes. video? It's called The Story of Stuff. Okay. And it's, um, I know Annie Leonard, who's now the head of Greenpeace, who made that. And she, she's great. Um, I've seen her paper markers version of her presentation um, several times before she made a video out of it that just went viral and got really popular. Is she from Honolulu? What's that? Where is she from? from? Um, she lives in uh, Berkeley. Okay. And um, I've, in my workshops over the years, done very similar things um, to what she puts out, and uh, I don't have anything to draw this on, but um, basically you have four um, sectors that materials flow through. You have extraction, production, consumption, and waste. She has distribution, I just have that as an arrow. But basically, let's take paper, for example. Um, so this piece of paper was a tree at one point, so you have an extraction phase, we're cutting down trees, you use a lot of energy and create pollution and stuff in the course of that. Then you truck them to a paper mill and you burn coal if you're lucky or if you're not so lucky, tires or other nasty things um, to power the mill and you pump out a lot of pollution and create a lot of waste and you chlorine bleach the stuff and you have dioxins and all that. And then you bring it to like Staples or somewhere where you're buying your thing of paper and your experience and your schools and institutions experiences are just in that purchasing phase, that little arrow where it goes to the consumer. And you don't see all this stuff behind it. You don't have to think of the forest and the paper mills. Uh, you, there's no label on there that says, this community was poisoned by the paper mill, and this forest was felled for this piece of paper. And you don't have that information. And so it's just <coughs> sanitized. The consumption is sanitized. You just have this ream of paper, you buy it, you use it, and they throw it away. And, and it's also sanitized for us. You don't see where a way is. You don't know and go visit the landfill and incinerator communities. The waste baskets don't say, like, this little girl got asthma because you burned it in her community. You know, it doesn't have that kind of psychological impact. Mm -hmm. So consumption is sanitized for us. We buy things in a clean way, we throw them away in a clean way. It's a linear process unless you're recycling and avoiding the landfills and avoiding extra extraction and production and getting things in a secular um, type of format. I don't know why I just went on that tangent. Do we know how much of this waste end up in the ocean? Um, a lot, well, a lot of plastic does, but you folks know that better than I do, I'm sure. Um, we have a huge garbage patch in the middle of the ocean with plastic. And we have it washing up on shore all the way from Fukushima right now. So in yeah. terms of plastics, I mean, which ones, I which mean, ones if we look worst? at the recyclables or, or what, you know, glass, go here, metals, I mean, right now, Bobby Jean said really the last, at one of the Environmental Management Commission meetings, said really that we could only make money from metal, the sale of metal, but um, sort of, but yet say um, Rick Anthony who did the zero waste plan, his thing is no, we can do a lot. You know, there's a lot of value in each of these other resources. And I, I just don't know um, if you could sort of comment on sort of 
those different waste streams and, and <coughs> what how to maximize those? Um, I've seen some of the data on this, but I don't have enough on the top of my head to really answer this. I know metal is the most valuable, aluminum especially, is very energy intensive to refine from bauxite ore, so the recycling of it is the most profitable. Um, paper has been kind of all over the place in terms of the marketability of it, and glass is kind of the worst at the moment, it's kind of down the dumps. Glass is sort of in there somewhere in the middle as well. So it depends on the type of material, what the markets are for them at the moment, but you want to seek the highest and best use of all these things. So you want to get them as high to like reuse is the best um, as far as post-consumer things. Of course, if you can avoid consuming them in the first place, that's the reduced part. But reuse, there are a lot of examples. Like um, I think there's a there's a beer bottle company in Canada that actually still takes back the bottles and washes them, and they get used again. And, did you want to fill it off? Well, okay. I don't drink beer, so I don't know this, but I don't put it all up in, so I should. Um, no, this at least. Um, there are electronics um, examples like with, um, I think it's Xerox, somewhere in Europe, they, instead of throwing out these whole machines that have all but one workable part in them, and just, you just throw the whole thing out, they have this big warehouse, and they take these big copy machines back, and they like switch parts out, and they have good workable machines again. And so there should be a lot more of this going on in the reuse sector, because recycling is still problematic. Like, you don't want to live next to a plastics recycling factory. That's not going to be a, a nice thing to live next to. So, and a lot of other recycling things aren't going to be as nasty as plastics, but are still not going to be the best things to have as neighbors. So, if you can keep things in the reuse sector or even reduce it, those are preferable and you want to keep as high as you can. So, is there a risk on recycling now? Like, uh, uh, like I and form of contamination and uh, for the water and the and, and emission. Is there a risk and contamination and, and piling up a large amount of, of rubbish to sort out? I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Uh, the What's question the is uh, what kind of risks are there risks? Are they risks yeah. on recycling the amounts of rubbish? Um, yeah, it depends on what the industry is, what they're processing. Like, I would say in addition to plastics recycling, uh, electronics recycling is also <coughs> pretty polluting, especially the place where they have to smelt down circuit boards, because they have a lot of things that are just being melted down. It's basically like incineration. If you have plastics and metals in there, and you're melting them down to get the metals, what do you think is happening to the plastics? They're just getting burned off. It's like, it's basically an incinerator probably without the controls. So which ones are some of the precautionary steps to uh, be able to handle a situation like that? That's a perfectly timed, timed question. So if, if, with that example we're talking about with electronics, for example, there's a campaign for green electronics, and the European Union has actually set standards to get things like bromide and flame retardants and other toxic chemicals out of the manufacturing <coughs> process for electronic goods or for electronic goods that become waste. And so if we can get PVC plastics, which is the most toxic plastic, it's polyvinyl chloride, number three. Plastic, if we can phase that out every sector we can, because that is the only plastic that's made with chlorine, and it creates all these toxic chemicals in the manufacture and the disposal, so it's important to go after some of those worst culprits and just phase them out of products and replace them with things that don't involve halogens or toxic metals on that chart, so it's going to be greener when we recycle it ultimately. So plastic number three is one we don't want. That's the number one thing I'll get rid of. And you're just very and, and, and which, and which things are plastic number three? What? It, that's like um, plastic toys? Some of those toys. Um, all the I can't yeah, hear you. The plumbing, she's plumbing. saying all the plumbing, the plastic plumbing tubes oh, are PVC made pipes, of no PVC pipe, the <laughs> vinyl siding on houses as well. And all the copper electric wires that are lighting up this room right now are coated with PVC plastic, which is the most dangerous plastic you can be so coated with. So PVC plastic. So, so we need to find non-chlorinated plastic alternatives. Non-chlorinated. Or non-plastic alternatives if we can. But at least get the chlorinated stuff out of there. That's really dangerous. So like uh, in California, they, they're already recycling a lot of this plastic, and they have a lot of employees working on it. What are 
sort of the steps for the health department, let's say. How can we uh, monitor the risk of uh, sort of these uh, chemicals or diazides, uh, toxins to? It's difficult. To yeah. how can, uh, I mean, like, can they say, well, we can have uh, recycling because it's too much risk. That's well, why the recycling doesn't need to be cost the rush. Stream. Yeah, you don't right. want to have to be recycling really toxic things if you can phase out the toxins in the first right, place. Right. right, or like with the computers, it's fix it rather than break it down. Yes, and, and combat planned obsolescence. So you don't have things that are designed to last a few years and then break, and they have to replace them or fashion uh, and apply to electronics where all of a sudden it's out of style and useless after a few years and you have to get a new one. Uh, we need to be encouraging companies to make things that aren't just filling their bottom line by throwing things out faster and actually lasting longer and being durable, which is really hard in this economy. So we need qualified people to be on top of this issue. So That's why we're out of time. Let me put a quick yeah. plug for a documentary real quick, which you can find online and then I know we have to be out of here. Um, there's a documentary called um, The Light Bulb Conspiracy, and it's all about planned obsolescence. And it's basically about, um, like, there's a light bulb that actually has been burning for over 100 years in California, a single light bulb. And they design, redesign them so that they don't and can't last that long. They've done all sorts of things, including electronics. So it's a very good documentary. What, what's the name of it? The Light Bulb Conspiracy. Yeah. You can find it's a really good Okay, one. so let's get to the sign sheet. Can the sheet reach everyone? Is that one raised? And I think we would like to have Ray or someone who knows talk a little bit about where Mike is going to be next. Because maybe you have friends in the other part of the island. I don't know about you all, but I found this absolutely every single minute some of the most valuable time I've spent over the past four or so months thinking about this issue. So if you have any friends that live out in Waimea, or can we just... Sure, well, I don't have the schedule with me, unfortunately, but Mike is going to be speaking at, at Tutu's house. Uh, when is that? Do you remember most? Uh, I'm calling it up. Do you have the schedule? And then, okay, and then while that information is coming up, I think right, we I have it in my newsletter. Ray, some thanks, because he's supposed to have that one. Friends that live in Waimea or the other places, make sure they get to see Mike. And then the video, Donald, the video. Yep, it'll be, it'll be uh, posted in the next couple days. And how does sure. one find it? Oh, at Occupy uh, Hawaii on YouTube. YouTube. Occupy, Occupy. So Hawaii if you type, YouTube. if you Google Occupy Hawaii YouTube, it should pop up. Actually, we you can send out them. a follow-up email to all those who sign up on the sheet, and then we can send out links to right. that and. But, you know, I'd also like your presentations to get those and get those into the council so then they'll be distributed as a uh, written testimony <coughs> and then when you're speaking, you can just, they'll have all of that incinerator stuff and everything and, and they can use it and then look, you know, go to the zero waste or whatever you're talking about. But since there isn't going to be as much time, it'll at least have it there before them. You have to get it in like before um, uh, 12 noon on Monday, so we can work on that. And Tuesday at 1.30 is the hearing. Uh, what? Tuesday at 1.30 is the hearing on some zero waste issues initiatives that our champion Margaret Willie is bringing up for us. And then March 8th and 9th we have the health plan, the future of zero waste in Hawaii. So if we all attend, we'll be very informed. We can help inform others. Anything else? And Mike will be at the Waimea Public Library Saturday, the 28th, 3 p.m., Racing to Zero movie. And then Mr. Mike. And North Kohala Public Library, March 2nd, Monday, 5.30. Very good. And then Tutu's House in Waimea, 
March 4th, Wednesday, 530. Okay. What is the baby? That was amazing. I'm so proud of you. Good job. Yeah, maybe we could also get some of this on to, you know, the on the drink. public television. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Okay, listen, I'll just tell you this about American Beauty Box. Dex Doc? And they sent us a new one. Dex Doc? Trace. Hmm? Do you have a card on?